My name's Rob Liffrith. Uh, I'm with ISO Talent. It is my unique pleasure to introduce a good friend of mine. This is um, Carl and I have known, known each other for years. Uh, if you have not met Carl, once you meet Carl, he is your buddy for life. Um, he is, he's a local boy. Actually, you just grew up the road? Yeah, I'm from Centerville. Okay, so down the road here. Um, and he has had a really, I love his journey. I'll let him explain a little bit more in, in his career path and where he's gone. And, and the thing I like about it is he's taken that journey to really shape the way that he looks at talent, looks at the different phases of talent and, and how you utilize it in your companies, both in a small stage and a large stage. Uh, Carl recently started as the head of, head of uh, human resources at Cafe Zupas. Um, they are expanding rapidly. Um, and so he is, he is very, very busy right now to, to, uh, and we're really happy that he's taking some time out to talk to us today about talent in each stage of the, of the company's growth. So without further ado, I'll turn the time over to Carl Sakia. Okay, everybody, aloha. aloha. Thank you. That's the way we kick things off in Hawaii. So I'm a, I'm a local boy here, but also born and raised in uh, um, island of Oahu, North Shore in Laie, Hawaii. And uh, we moved here when I was a young boy. So my dad was born and raised in the island of Fiji. My mom's from Norway. So she's Norwegian. So I'm going to call myself a Fiji-Wegian, right? <laughs> Fijian-Norwegian. So, But then born in, uh, in the, the beautiful state of uh, Aloha, Hawaii. And uh, then we moved here when I was a young boy. So I grew up just down the road. I've got one of my classmates, Tina Alfred, uh, and I grew up over here in Taylorsville. And uh, and uh, love this community. Love being here. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful to be able to come here and talk a little bit about a subject that's near and dear to my heart, and it's talent. And so this is a space that I've, I've grown my career in that I absolutely adore. It's one that I've learned a lot of just through, you know, a lot of experience in growing in businesses. I've had the opportunity to work in a lot of different types of businesses, a lot of different places. Um, and uh, I've gained a lot of experience. Really, the, my, my, uh, my professional journey has really been my classroom, being able to learn a lot about these things that we'll talk about today. And so um, I'm going to give you a lot of the uh, journey that I went through and be able to, I've, I've come to a lot of, I guess, uh, aha moments along the journey in my career that I want to be able to share some of those with you as you start to think about growing your teams, whether you're a small business, whether you've been around uh, for a long time and you're now wanting to fuel growth, brand new, Whatever phase you're in, I think the principles we'll talk about today will really uh, connect with you because we're in a very strange state when it comes to talent. And uh, COVID coming in 2020, which I'll talk about in just a moment, really threw that even more up in the air. We've got a young generation that's very different than anybody's been. We've got people who uh, are more flexible and wanting to do more than they ever have. There's a lot of change. And so hopefully you're able to gain some insights um, related to your business in regards to kind of the career journey that I've had. So um, a little bit about me just to kick us off and... Yep. Uh, this is my family, my ohana. So as you can see, I am a girl dad. I've got six girls. And the gogs, yep, you guessed it, girls. So I, uh, I'm surrounded by ladies all the time. I've got only sisters, no brothers. Uh, and so I, I latch on to my dad very closely, right? And so that's, uh, that's our family. So my wife, Jennifer, and I have known each other since I was 13 years old. I'm very blessed. I still tell her, I don't know how in the world you, you agreed to marry this kooky guy, but... Um, and then we've got, we've got our six daughters. Our oldest, Marley, um, is, a, is a junior in high school. So we've got two in high school, uh, Marley and Caden on the side. We've got Irie and Kaya, Zuri and Rooney. So you can tell we love, number one, I love Bob Marley. So you can hear the Marley and the Irie and the Kaya. That's, I love, I love Bob Marley. So, and my wife, my wife does too. So, uh, but this is our family and uh, family is everything to me. Um, they, uh, they've come on the journey and been on this whole, uh, this whole wild ride with me. A little bit about my my background, I think, uh, yeah, before I get into this, I come from the world of hospitality. So just to give you a short background, I'll try and give you the brief background of where I come from and where I've gained a lot of my experience. So I grew up just down, just down the road over here in Taylorsville, the Kearns part of Taylorsville um, area just down the street. And I didn't, you know, I really didn't, I, I got kicked out of two high schools. Um, I got kicked out of Cottonwood High School and Taylorsville High School. It's not because I had bad grades or I was a poor student. I just didn't like going to class. That's the part I didn't like about it. Right? I could go in, I could take a test, and I could pass it. I could get a 31 on the ACT, like I was fine. I just liked the social experiment better than I actually liked the classwork. 
And so I like going out, and I didn't even, I, 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 and Tina can testify to this. I was friends with everybody. I would go to, I'd go to breakfast. I'd get to work. I'd get to school, and the Cowboys were like, Carl, we're going out to eat breakfast. I'm like, I'm going to go with you guys. Let's go. So I'd hang out with the Cowboys. We'd be on our way back, and the jocks are like, yeah, we're going to head to breakfast. I'm like, well, I could eat another thing of food. And, and I love people. And so that's where I really found my calling, which was in direct conflict to what I was supposed to be doing. So coming up, I had kind of a tumultuous relationship with my parents, as you can probably guess. And uh, they wanted me to really follow the letter of the law and do what I need to do, and I just became, became a wild one. When I was at the age of 21, I decided to become a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints based here in Salt Lake City. And I ended up serving a mission at 22, almost 23 years old. And nobody, my, a lot of my friends weren't members of the church. I just, it was a personal journey where I just said, you know, I want to discover myself. I want to discover a higher purpose. And so that's where I really kicked off my entire professional career. Going out in the mission field, I ended up going, I didn't know a lot about the church and the doctrine, but what I did know is I love serving people. I'd be in my suit and they'd ask me a question. I was like, I don't know, ask my companion. Happy to mow your lawn, right? I can, I can change your tire. Like I, I loved, I fell in love with service. It was great. And so my first area um, that I was serving in, a gentleman who was uh, kind of watched over us said, Carl, what are you going to do when you get home? And remember, I had a lot of friends who were in gangs, troublemakers, challenges, so I was just trying to discover my own life and figure out my path. So I said, I don't know what I'm going to do two years from now. I'm just trying to figure out what I'm doing right now. And he said, you need to be a firefighter. And I said, why? And he said, because you're Polynesian, which means you're strong and you're really funny. And I said, so are those the criteria for being a firefighter? Is that, is that what it boils down to? And so I, at the end of my mission, guess what I did? Came home. This city right here, I went through West Valley City's firefighting program. Ended up uh, trying to figure out what I was going to do while I was in the firefighting program. Found a job making $5 an hour plus tips, driving a shuttle van downtown Salt Lake to and from the airport. That's all I did. So on the day, I'd drive back and forth to the airport and pick people up and put them in a hotel. And the evenings, I'd just right up the street, I'd come and do firefighting classes for just about a year. Ended up graduating from the fire program, fire one, fire two, and hazardous materials. Uh, but then it was just post 9-11, and so everybody wanted to be a firefighter. And, uh, and so I just kept going the hotel route. They kept promoting me. They said, oh, you, we want to make you a front office manager. I was like, no, no, I, I'm a firefighter. I'm going to be a firefighter. Well, then they kept promoting me to the point where I was like, gosh, I, this, this might be a career journey I need to go on. So I did. I am getting in operations at that same hotel where I was a shuttle driver and worked there for a couple of years. And then a gentleman came along who would always eat breakfast with us and said, Carl, I want to take you on a journey to be an HR. I said, what's HR? He said, don't worry, I'll teach you. And so the first job I ever had was a corporate recruiter for a small company based in Park City called Gemstone Resorts. And that's how the rest of my career happened. This gentleman just invited me in, taught me how to recruit, and uh, that's what I did, gosh, over 20 years ago. So from there, I ended up working for uh, Grand America and Little America Hotel Salt Lake as a manager. Uh, Star uh, Starwood Hotels, which has now been acquired by Marriott, brought me on to be a director of HR, my first stint. I didn't think I could do it. Oh, I'd only had HR for two years, no college degree, nothing, and uh, they gave me a shot. I ended up going to Steamboat Springs, Colorado, winning the largest award globally you can win for Starwood Hotels, put me on the map. Who's this young, hungry guy? So then they end up having me open hotels all across the country. Luxury, St. Regis, Weston, Sheraton, Lay Meridian, you name it, W. And it was a blast. Absolutely loved it. I opened St. Regis Deer Valley here in Utah. Then they end up shipping. They said, what do you want to learn now? I said, I want labor relations. They said, we can go to Kauai, Hawaii, or you can go to Chicago, Illinois. I said, do you think the mob is still, like, associated with the unions? They said, could be. And I was like, cool. I'm going to go to Chicago. They're like, why would you want to do that? And I said, I want to jump into the deep end of the pool. I want them threatening my life. You only get one life, YOLO, right? It's just, I just want to go. And so they said, if you wait one year, we can get you a job there. And, uh, and so I, I said, okay, I'll wait. I'd love to go to Chicago. Then in the meantime, the regional for uh, the French Polynesia in Hawaii, her name is Nona Tamanaha, called me and said, why does the Polynesian boy keep going more east? Come back west toward the Pacific Ocean. And so she said, I've got an opening right now where we'll, you'll gain a lot of experience. You're going to uh, gain uh, union experience, contract experience um, at the St. Regis in uh, the North Shore of Kauai, Hawaii. So I went to Princeville, St. Regis, Princeville, if anybody's ever been to Kauai. Lived there for a few years, loved it. Then the Grand Wailea with Hilton stole me. They called and said, we just fired all of our leadership. The government of Singapore bought the resort. We're a 1,500-employee resort, largest union property. Come join us. Did that, loved it. We had a lot of success. Grand America called and said, come back home, Carl. Now you've got all this global experience. Come run HR for our company. So that's what I did. Came back and did that and loved it. Four, four years ago, I decided to leave that and start my own little consulting business and go out and journey the world. I work with clients as big as USANA and so on and, and, um, and as, as small as BYU football with 130 players. So it's been a real fun journey. But now I'm with Cafe Zupas, 
And what we do is we focus on talent. We want to be known as a people company, not a food company. So it's been a lot of fun to be able to join them and really focus on this thing called talent that we're going to discover a little bit more. So that's a little bit about my journey. But I want you to think about this. We're going to go through the next slides real quick. But I want you to think since 2020. We're now three years removed. But this changed a lot of the game. It changed our personal lives, our professional lives. So I just want you to take a quick moment to think of what changed, right? So if you look at all the things that happened, we had a lot of changes in politics, the stock market. We had changes in our businesses, in illnesses, in the, in the medical field. There was so much change and disruption that it started fueling a lot of things. There was social change. You know, uh, George Floyd, all these big topics that were coming across the United States were really fueling us along with this thing that was keeping us at home and really separating us from each other to have personal interaction. And so it just changed the way we did business. So I want you to think in your life and in your business, what's changed since then? What changed for the negative, but there were also some silver linings. What changed maybe for the positive that forced you to move into a position where you really had to think differently in, in order to grow and, and survive? And so... As we talk about this, change was a big thing. It was demanded. It was demanded by, you know, socially. It was demanded professionally. People wanted to see change. And this is continuing to happen. People are requesting change. They want change. They want to see things evolve. And they're constantly requesting and pushing us as business owners and business leaders to make sure we focus on the people. So there's a, there's, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of the Edelman Trust Barometer. There's one that just came out for 2023, but it's pretty similar data, so I haven't changed it out yet. But what it says is, this is what they do is, uh, Mr. Edelman goes out every year and he assesses t uh, trust factors. He goes out globally and says, what is it that people trust and they're looking for in the world? And so if you look at this, I think this data is really, really interesting. Number one, there's a failure of leadership and it makes distrust the default. So let me give you a couple of examples. Societal, societal leaders are not trusted. So what's funny is, if you look at the people that we, just as far as last year's data, and it's like I said, it's the same this year, people don't trust CEOs, journalists, and government leaders. That's gone down. But let me show you who we do trust as human beings. We trust citizens of our country, people in our local community, the national health authorities, my CEO, not any CEO, but my CEO, my coworkers, and then scientists, right? A lot of these are associated, whether it be national health or scientists have to do with the health piece. But everything else you'll notice, it's local. My community, my business, my CEO. We don't look outward anymore. We used to look to, let's look online at social media and see what my influencer is saying. Now they're saying, I don't want the influencer. I want to know what my, my people, my village is saying. So I want you to think about the, really where that leaves the microphone in your business to influence others. Okay. So when you look at circles of trust, like I said, they become more local. There's less trust for the outsiders. And they have closer bonds with neighbors and coworkers. You look at the net change year over year. So if you look at this net change, how close I feel to my neighbors, jumps seven points, huge jump. If you look at to my coworkers, six points, huge jump. And if you look there, the negative goes down. I don't listen to other uh, people from other countries, uh, people from other regions. I want to listen to the people that are in my, 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 in my community and in my immediate network. So a record trust gap between high and low income. We've never had one so big. High and low income have a major, and this actually divided even more in 2023 is people who are high net worth and the people who are at lower net worth, there's a major disconnect between the two. And so trying to put them on the same page is going to be something we've really got to focus on. So if you look at your hiring team members that are entry level, they won't always trust the outsider that's telling them something from a place that they don't feel that they can relate to. But they do trust their immediate network. So that's something to think about is the megaphone and, and kind of the microphone that you hold. All stakeholders hold business accountable. So this is an interesting one. If, as far as the influence that we have and what they're requiring of us in order to join our businesses and so forth, 58% buy or advocate for brands that are based on their beliefs and their values. Huge number, more than half. Say so that's actually a key piece that I look for when I'm doing business, right? So when you're looking at people, they want to identify with our brand. They want to identify with what your value proposition is before they'll jump in, right? 60% choose a place to work based on those beliefs and values. 64% invest based on their belief and values. And this is an interesting one. When you look globally, 88% of institutional investors subject ESG to the same scrutiny as operational and financial considerations. That's not always been a thing, right? So that's going to be a big thing that's changing as well. But if you look at this, it's people want to be able to identify and relate to the businesses that they go to work for. Trust, huge factor. So my employer media is the most believable. This is another thing I think is very interesting. 
So you look at my employer, right? 65%. That's something that communications from my employer can be uh, the, the um, let's see, uh, this is number of times needed to see the information appeal before believing it. Okay, 65. Then you look at national government, 58, media reports, major corporations, advertising, media reports, and then my social media feed. How much time do we spend here? People spend a lot of time here. What's funny is we don't believe it. We'll do it as entertainment. We don't actually believe it. That's not where we're taking our content from. We're, we're listening to it, reviewing it, but we're not letting it sink in. We're just using it as really just to kind of see what's going on outside, but that's not where we're building trust and credibility. It starts with their employer. That's wild. The source of information they're looking to is what does my employer say about it? So we have a very, very large responsibility. CEOs are expected to be the face of change. This is a very, this is a very big one. So CEOs should be personally visible when discussing public policy with external stakeholders or work their company has done to benefit society, 81%. People want CEOs to be at the helm talking about what's going on. They don't want just the company giving blanket addresses. They want somebody standing and telling in front of the business exactly what they're wanting to do. Second is when considering a job, I expect that CEO to speak publicly about controversial social and political issues that I care about. That's 60% and it's growing. So that's one thing I know we don't want to be, right? We want to be in that neutral space, don't love to take sides, but this is what's being asked of us, is we're saying people are choosing business based on this thing. So whether or not you want to take a stand on a situation, you've got to consider what people are expecting out of the business and then figure out how you're going to really move forward with that because trust is everything in a business. So the first thing that we can do now that we've come out of this major change is we need to focus on ourselves. We need to see how we can retool, kind of you know, take a fresh breath, new approach and say what got us here that won't get us there because i think what coming out of this this big change some people say well we're just going to do business as normal we're just going to keep marching forward the way that we did it before and i promise you that will not work it won't work it'll only take you so far we've got to be able to take a step back and really reassess our status so i love this picture because it's on on an airplane has anybody ever been on an airplane and can you describe what this is it's oxygen right and what do they give us as guidance when we get on that plane they get on the emergency and they say, if there's an emergency, you'll see these drop out of the air. And what do they say? Who, who, who should you put it on first? Put it on yourself first and then worry about putting it on the person next to you. You ever thought about why that is? Same reason it's applicable in business. First person we need to look at is right here. We need to look at ourselves and see are we prepared to be able to go help others? Because a lot of time we spend time and we do it backwards. We go out trying to help other people and then we're not properly equipped or properly tooled. That's where I think a lot of this piece comes from when it comes to people saying, oh, my mental health because we're not tooling ourselves and then we're exhausting ourselves and we're not properly prepared and it gets frustrating. It's hard because we're not really looking internally before we have to go forward, right? So you want to put ourselves on a very, very strong foundation and good footing before we need to go out and start focusing on a lot of these things. So when I talk about the change that needs to happen, here are a couple different areas that I want you to think about. Number one, no longer as businesses can we be reactive. Reactive is not is a thing of the past. People don't want reactive. You look at a company like Crumble Cookies. Crumble located here in, in, in South Valley, corporate office over in Orem, Utah. Crumble is enormous. They're everywhere, right? One of the reasons, is it because their cookies are really that great? Sorry if anybody's here from Crumble. They're good, right? But they're so easy to access. They're so convenient. To be able to get on, get on and in 10 seconds, choose a gift, send it to a neighbor, and then push send and you're done. Convenience is everything. That's not a reactive prompt, right? They're pushing things to say, hey, use our app, use our app, push this. You want to send a gift to a friend? They're trying to really push. We can't be reactive and wait for people to come to us. We need to go out and we need to make sure that everything that we do is anticipatory. How are we anticipating the market? How are we anticipating what's coming down the road? How much time and attention do you give to discussing anticipation in your business? What's on the horizon tomorrow? Because a lot of time what we're talk fo focused on are the lag measures. Everything in the lag. Let's look at revenue. Revenue's already happened. Right? Let's look at you know, these costs. Let's look at P&L. It's already happened. You're talking about the past. How do we talk about the future and how to anticipate what's around the corner? And I think that's where we really learned a lot from COVID. Right? A lot of things we weren't prepared for and now we're ready. Right? Now we're ready. But now how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? Whether it's COVID or something else, how do we think about how we're going to handle the future? So we can't be reactive. We need to be anticipatory. Second area is we can't focus on the collective. We've done a good job in business of saying everything I do is just going to be blanketed. If I do it for you, I'm going to do it for everybody else. And in fact, I can't do it for you because if I did it for you, I'd have to do it for everybody else. Now, this is going to have to be a huge mindset change. We have to be individualized in our approach. Things have to be tailored. 
from our medical benefits programs to, you know, the key, uh, you know, wages, you name it, we've got to take an individual approach. Now, the challenge with this, it takes a lot of energy, a lot of energy. It takes time. It takes resources. But I promise you, this is one of the biggest keys to success in the future of work. We have to take an individualized approach to our people, whether it be a guest, a customer, our team members, our employees, our colleagues, whatever it is, it's got to be individualized, which, again, makes it harder. But that's what's really going to divide great leaders from leaders. Okay? The third that I bring up is transactional. No longer can we just be transactional. I'm going to give you a service. You come back and pay me, and we're done. It's all about the experience. We have to think experientially. Everything is about an experience. People will pay for an experience. They want an experience. And it's not just guests and clients. It has to start in your own four walls. Think back to the oxygen. We have to put our oxygen on first, create an experience for our people, and then we can expect them to go out and create an experience for others. Working in luxury hospitality, I saw this all the time. You go out and you treat them. I mean, I'm in luxury hotels. Go out and treat the guests. Be the best for them. You know, if they, you see, and there's all these case things, right? You know, you see uh, um, one of those popular in, in hotels is if you go into their bathroom and you notice a bunch of uh, toilet, they're out of their tissues, right? They're all out and they just checked in. That means they probably got a cold, right? So go, go, go put four boxes of tissues in there with a little note saying, guess what? You must be sick or something's wrong. So I got you some extra boxes so you don't need to call. I'll be anticipatory, right? Those are the kind of things that we think about, right? People want the experience. They want to know you're paying attention. Right? One I give all the times I used to train for Starwood, I'd go, and every time I'd go, as, I, as you can tell, I, I, I don't drink a lot of caffeine if you might think I do. But sometimes, sometimes I do. And so there are days where I'm like, oh, I need to drink like a Red Bull. Or, so I'd go, to, I'd go to this one hotel, and I'd always pull, they had Red Bull, uh, Mountain Dew, all these Pepsi products. I'd take the two Red Bulls they offer and the two Mountain Dews and throw them in my bag and go. Second day, two Red Bulls, two Mountain Dews, throw them in my bag and I'd go. Guess what happened when I opened the third day? They cleared everything out and filled it packed jammed with Mountain Dew and with Red Bull because somebody was paying attention, right? Those are the little, the little things that mean a lot because it means you're paying attention. That's the experiential I'm talking about. People want to be seen. They want to be noticed. And the more you anticipate, and this is in our personal lives too, right? So this is, and this is where I have to learn as a husband. Right? You've got to have that, create that experience. So experiential is another piece. Now I want to move on to kind of my philosophy. So I call this called the, what's called the experience ecosystem. So what I dumb my framework down is the four individual areas. And, I wanna, and I'll introduce them to you so you can think about these in your business. So if we're thinking about leadership, number one, do we have the right leaders in the right places? Do they have the right skills and abilities? So leader experience is one. Second is the employee or team member experience, okay? You know, what kind of environment are we creating or experience are we creating for our people? Third is the customer or whoever our target audience is. What kind of experience are we creating for them? And then lastly is this brand experience. What are we doing to communicate and what are people seeing as a third party? You can't control Yelp. You can't control all these things. That's where your brand experience really gets is. Where people are talking about you, that's how you know you're going to have success. So an easy way to remember these areas are four Ps. So I created this framework in my, in my basement when I started my consulting company. I said, Carl, what have you learned over your whole career? And it's dumbed down to these things. Peopletivity drives productivity, which drives profitability, which then goes and leads to prosperity within your organization. So the first thing I want to talk about is peopletivity. Peopletivity is the relationship between the leaders and the team members that you've got, right? You've got to focus on both things. I want you to ask yourself, how often do we talk about that relationship? In a week, in a month, in a quarter, in a year, right? Second is productivity. That's the relationship between our team members and our customer experience. It's if you're, you know, if you're moving so many cogs, how long does it take to get cog, cog A to cog B? How long do these processes take? We look at these metrics all the time. Right? Productivity is a huge driver. Labor, whatever you measure. Do we talk about this? We do. How much time do you spend talking about it? I want you to think about that. Third is profitability. Profitability is people vote with their credit cards. Right? So when you think about profitability, that's the relationship between the customer and your brand. How often are you talking about that relationship? Right? Whether that be in the form of revenue, EBITDA, whatever it may be, how often do you spend talking about that? And then finally, the relationship. If you've got a strong brand, it's going to attract growth, better leadership, better team. You know, you watch organizations go from small business, publicly traded companies, the whole C-suite gets readopted, and everybody comes from Silicon Valley and takes over the business to try and take it to another level, right? We talk about growth all the time, which I call prosperity. This is the growth of a company, the success. How often are you talking about the future of your organization, where you want to grow to multi-unit, whatever you want to be, how often are you talking about that? Now, as an HR professional, which I don't like HR, hate the term, 
right? I think it's a very reactive discipline, trying to reposition that. I've, I've never been, a, like I told you, I kind of got into my role accidentally. So I, I'm not a, you know, formal HR fan. But, you know, in learning what I've learned, a lot of it is that proactivity of talking about these things. I want to focus on pro- people-tivity today because I think it's going to be the most beneficial to you whatever stage in your business you are. So this relationship I call people-tivity is between your leaders and your employers, or your employees. So in people-tivity, in the, gr- the right leaders on the right seats on the right buses are going to be a catalyst to a great team member or employee experience. You still need to give them the tools to succeed, but you've really got to reassess. How many of you have hung on to a leader in your business, whether it be now or a former, former business life you've been in, how many have held on to a leader for way too long? Anybody? Can you raise your hand? And I want you to think about it. Some are like, no, man. I always do. Yeah. Baloney. So the big thing, I've done it. We've all done it. And a lot of that is out of convenience. Would you agree? Like, I can't. And maybe it's not convenience. It's really, we're just trying to stay afloat. If I get rid of this person, nobody can man the ship. Right? I don't have any, I don't have any substitutes. I don't have anybody else out there, which comes to the reactive nature of our business. Again, how often are we talking about people activity? Right? If I know I've got people that are not performing to the standard I need them, or they're not well aligned, or I made a mistake in the hiring position, that's human. That happens. But in order for us to grow our businesses, we've got to adapt quickly. We've got to say, okay, great, I made a mistake. How do I figure out the future forward? And you can do it in a very human way, and I'll talk about that. But this relationship between leaders and then the employee experience, again, this has become enhanced with COVID. Work from home. I want these benefits. We need child care. All these things that we've talked about for years and years has been enhanced to the 10th degree. So really creating that experience, and it's not about ping pong tables and lunch rooms filled with food. I'm telling you, it's about the individual approach you take toward a human being. So when you look at the offerings you're spending money on, we all like to go, great, I've got this great benefits package, and it helps everybody. 401k for everybody. Well, 401k for everybody, when you know 90% of your people are under the age of 21 that could care less about 401k and just want to take their money and buy, you know, pay off their car, we've got to think about it. We've got to think about how we're doing these things. It might be important to us, and it might be important to our generation, but it might not be important to another person's generation. And that can work in reverse. You don't offer a 401k, but most of your people are in a place where they're thinking about retirement. Something you better think about, right? So really being thinking that individual tailored approach is going to lead to success. So a couple of areas. Number one, we all want to hire superheroes, right? That's the goal. What is a superhero? Well, I look at Superman, Clark Kent. Now, all Clark, I, love, I love Superman because it was like this was his costume, right? It was like... If it went, as soon as he did this, it was like, oh my gosh, that's Superman. I didn't know when you had the glasses on, right? That's really what it is. People are in front of us all the time, and they go like this, and they're going, oh, wow, you're different, right? Now they're the same person, right? We just have to do a good job at vetting who we're getting. So when we think about leaders, I want you to think about your leaders that you currently have, and I want you to think about the leaders that you're actually going to bring on board, right, and that you're going to do in the future. How do you identify these superheroes? What are you using right now? Probably, I would have to guess the majority of you are either using your gut or using some kind of technology, hopefully, right? I know a lot of us just wing and say, I've, I've, I've actually, I interview really well. I've got, you know, I read a book and it's got these three questions that are perfect. I had a mentor that taught me this one question. Can you do this jigsaw puzzle in three minutes? Go ahead, sir. And if they look at you confused, you don't hire them, right? So, and, it's, and it really is. It's this kind of this methodology. How many of you have actually been through a true professional way of interviewing, course, certification, have any kind of, you know, major you know, experience with it where you've actually received some kind of accreditation. Correct. And you're all business owners and business leaders. We use our gut. And a lot of time, has anybody gotten into leadership position? They say, we're going to train you to identify leaders. Would you agree with me that talent is probably one of the most important things to fuel your business, but yet none of us have the tools to really do it the right way? Fascinating. I'm an HR guy. I don't even do it. Nobody taught me. I'm winging it too. I was getting the guy from the library going, hey, Great questions. I'm Xeroxing it and using it. And you know what I mean? That's what we do. But I want you to think of talent as what's going to be the catalyst for success in your business. The first cog that you need to focus on the rest of the P's is your leadership team. I want you to think about what you're using. One of my favorite things to do is review a resume. A resume is beneficial. I'm here to tell you that they're not. Do you know how? Re- I want you to take a moment with me, okay? Take a step back and tell me how a resume is compiled. This is how it happens. Carl is incredible. He had all these great metrics. He is amazing. Print. Carl, you're amazing. That is literally how a resume is created. I am putting down all the greatest things I feel about myself. 
with any metrics that I can think are associated, and I'm giving it to you, and you're going, wow. Now, how bad is that when people go, ooh, it's not very good. Dang. Resume writing skills needed, right? So, but really, this is what we're doing, a lot of us are doing. And again, how many of us now, maybe it's not interviewing skills, have been trained how to properly read a resume to identify the certain things you need? You're not, right? But this is how we're looking at talent, right? This was my favorite, one of my favorite movies of all time. Has anybody ever seen Moneyball? This is one of the greatest business movies I've ever seen in my life when it comes to really changing the way that we look at business. So if you've got Billy Bean, who is the person that uh, um, Brad Pitt is portraying, Billy Bean's role was the general manager for the Oakland Athletics. Billy Bean was a former baseball player, highly rated person, comes in, and the Oakland A's have not been known, I'm sorry if there's some Oakland A fans out here, have never been known as this, this team that just spends tons of money, has great people, they're kind of your blue collar gutter team, and he even describes that, he says, yeah, there's the Yankees, there's this team, and there's a, you know, a whole bunch of crap, and then there's us, right? And that's what he says. So he says, how are we going to identify talent? So in this movie, if you haven't seen the movie, I'll, I'll brief it for you. What happened is these are the wise men, as you can see, with their nice full heads of hair, right, sitting here that have been assessing talent for ages for the organization. Probably 50 years they've been looking at talent. And when the scene starts, they're all in the room, they're debating different talent. So-and-so, he's not very good. Why do you say he's not good? Well, the girlfriend's ugly. Well, why does it matter if his girlfriend? He lacks confidence. You know, and that's, that's literally how they're going about each person and trying to identify whether somebody's good or not. Well, he comes in and says, we need to think differently. And they say, Billy, collectively we have thousands of years of experience in this room. Why in the world would we change anything? We've been doing this. This is the way it's done. And so what Billy Bean does is he actually goes and, and, and finds out about this thing called sabermetrics. Sabermetrics actually takes data and takes it on each individualized person and can tell you it, it, there's only two areas you really need to focus on. People look at grandiose things. How many home runs did they have? All these flashy metrics. And he said, all I care about is your slugging percentage and your on-base percentage. All I care about is if you can get on to first base. And they say, well, what if they walk them all the time and it's not a strike or they're, they're not hitting the ball? I don't care. As long as they get to first base, that's what matters to us. So they go and hire the island of misfit toys that nobody wants. They do it at below budget and they bring people in and they end up getting into the playoffs with them. And the whole idea was baseball rejected that entire ideology. The gentleman that created Sabermetrics, he had said this for years, like, this is the way we have to look at people. It uses data. It's very intelligent. People said, no, I'm going to go with the white hair and the gut, the gut instincts. And what proved it, so he ended up getting that far just using this, this data to analyze. Well, furthermore in the story, which they don't really talk about, I mean, they talk about it just in words at the very end, the Boston Red Sox tried to recruit him the next year based on the success he had. He ended up turning down the job and not taking it. Well, they ended up winning the World Series based on that, based on the, their use of Sabermetrics. And their, their general manager and CEO attributed it back. They hired the guy who created Sabermetrics, brought him in, and then they win the World Series and break the curse of the great Bambino. They've also had success with the Cleveland Browns, first time they ever got to the playoff in a long time, using Sabermetrics. So these are principles that were rejected by the world, but were actually used you know, for a good purpose and to be really introduce technology and a different concept into their business. So I want you to think about what you're doing. What kind of analytics are you using, right? What kind of ways are you trying to be different to really think about people? There's a lot of things out there, a lot of tools, a lot of really good organizations of people. Maybe you're one of them. But I want you to think of how really you're using technology. So one of the things I love is I use a tool, and this is in my professional business. Um, I've used a tool called Print. This is actually a uh, tool, and a, I'm not selling it. I don't have an independent business anymore. But this is just one that I use. And there's only a few of us that are certified to do this. Um, and the gentleman that actually created his name is Dr. Paul Hertz. There's two of us that do this in the United States. Uh, my buddy introduced me to him. Dr. Hertz is a genius. What he does, he's actually gone through and created an algorithm that identifies people's subconscious motivation. It's fascinating. I do this work with BYU football. I do this with other organizations in my consulting. Don't do it anymore. Do it with BYU still. So that's why we're, we're now 2-0. Hopefully we win next week. But, you know, we've been doing this for three, four years with the team. And this is just one of the analytics I went. Doesn't mean it's the only one you can use. Doesn't mean it's the best. This is just one that, for an example that I use. So I actually go in to look for leadership, and I real, what, what he discovered in his research, Dr. Hertz, was that we're all very unique. We might look the same. We might like the same things. Strengths, for example, all those things might be the same, but we're individual like a fingerprint. We're all super, super hyper unique. So what he identified is how do you find out what subconsciously really influences a person or motivates them? So what he identified again through his research was this is what we look like. This is what you know about me. This is what you know about your colleagues. This is what you know about people in your neighborhood, right? But guess what? Guess what they are? This. 
this is who they really are, right? This is the depth. But you don't get to see it. Not everybody tells you everything about themselves. They don't, you don't know where they are. Sometimes they don't even know where they're at in life. They're trying to figure it out and discover it. This is who humans are. We might look the same, but this is where it really the, this is where you win the battle. Is finding out subconsciously on the bottom what do our people really need to lift them up and keep them going on the top part of that iceberg. So I love the iceberg as a metaphor. But how are you identifying what's happening on the under, uh, under the water line in your organization, in your community, and so forth? For him, with this tool, he identifies unconscious motivators. He actually went through and did the research, and what it came down to, he identified there's nine unconscious motivators all of us have. And the way these unconscious motivators work is through, through time, when we're a child, we're young, what happens is these young people, if you look at a little child, what happens when they fall over? First thing they do, before they cry, before they do anything, does anybody know? They look up at an adult or they look at somebody and they're trying to gauge, what do I do now? You ever realize that? They'll fall and they'll look and be like, and if you go, oh no, they'll start to cry, right? If you go, oh, get up like my dad did, boy, get up, you know, okay. You know, you, you, you're starting to formulate how you view the world and how you're going to react to life, right? That's what he discovered is all nine of these unconscious motivators are active when we're born. And we're trying to figure them out, what our, what our likes, our dislikes, how, we, how we're going to see the world and what motivates us. By the time we turn 12, 13 years old, those four dial, or nine dial, dial down to four, and four of them are active. The other five are dormant. We'll never use them again. By the time you turn 18, 19 years old, two of them will dominate and be the, dri the major drivers in all of your motivation for the rest of your life. And they won't change because they are now set in stone. They can be influenced by other things, but they're not going to change based on his science. And then that will go on until the rest of your life. These two things. So how do you identify what those two things are? So these are the two. Or these are the all nine. One of them, you'll have two of them that work together. One's a major and one's a minor. One's stronger than the other and can be a primary. But it would be very interesting to understand and know this information. Wouldn't you agree? For things to be perfect, correct, and right. To be needed and appreciated. To succeed and achieve. To be special and find meaning in life. To be knowledgeable and smart. To be safe and secure. To enjoy life and be happy. To be strong and self-reliant. To have peace and harmony. Wouldn't it be awesome if you knew what subconsciously drove the people that you live and work with every day. This has been a game changer in my, my consulting. Like I said, I don't use it. I still have my license, but I don't use it as actively anymore outside of my current business, Cafe Zupas. But with this, I mean, we do, I did this with Kalani Sataki, the head coach of BYU football three or four years ago. And the first thing he said is, I need this for my spouse. Guess what, funny thing, that every CEO says. They automatically start thinking about their family because that's the most important thing. But just imagine if it's that powerful, what if you do for your business? You can start to understand what motivates and drives a human being, right? And again, I'm not, I'm not promoting this as a tool. What I'm saying is, what are you using to try and identify those kind of things? This could be wrong for all I know. But what are you doing to really try to identify and understand what's lying beneath that water line with your people to properly put them in, in areas to succeed? So, so this is just a motivational model, like I said, with reliability, a lot of, lot of interesting things, the data. It all comes down to what you're using and how you're really trying to identify the right talent. There's a lot of cool things out there. Find your niche. Find what it is. Find what that thing that's going to help you so that you can get the right people in the right seat. Otherwise, everybody wins at that point. Because if you can understand them, then you can treat them well. They can also be able to fulfill their purpose. I can't tell you how many times I've sat with people and said, you're in the wrong job. And they're like, what? And I'm, I've been doing this for eight years. And I'm like, have you been happy? Well, no. You're in the wrong job. But guess what? They fear leaving the job because it's a guaranteed paycheck. They don't want to go out and discover it's comfort. Even if it's not, they're not happy in the world, they'll stay there because they, the, the unknown is behind that door. And they don't want to go into the unknown. It's scary. What if nobody wants them? You know, what if they can't get another job? You know, what, at least they, what they know is they, what they know. So that's something to think about is how do you now, in a human way, help them get to the next point? Because you can, and it would be a great thing. I can't tell you how many people have come back after we've let them go in a good way and given them time and helped them find other opportunities, come back and hug and say, I can't believe I, it took me this long to find something else that I love. Right? And I'm talking like we had an accountant that became a painter and found their definition in life and was selling things on Etsy, making way more than they were making as an accountant. It's fascinating. Right? These are the kind of things I want you to think about. So now going forward, this is a great quote. Here's something they'll probably never teach you in business school. The single biggest decision you make in your job, bigger than all the rest, is who you name manager. When you name the right people to manage your company's workplace, everything goes well. People love their jobs. Your customers are engaged. Life is great. When you name the wrong person manager, nothing fixes that bad decision. Not compensation, not benefits, nothing. That comes from uh, um, Jim Clifton, Chairman and CEO Gallup, written a bunch of books. Comes down to the relationship with the person and their leader. It's really what it boils down to. Right? And the leader is going to be a function of what you create for them to really be a great leader. So 
That's the leadership part when I talk about that leadership experience. You have the right people in the right seats on the right buses. Second is just the employee experience. I'm going to kind of push through this because it's pretty common sense. Again, being able to know people where they are, what their needs are, and finding this subconscious, uh, you know, drivers, or what are we doing to really discover that in all of our team members and all of our people? They have a lot of things going on in their life that you don't see every day. People battle from addictions. They battle from, you know, child care issues, right? Having, having knucklehead kids like Carl probably stressed my mom out as a nurse for work for 20 years, right? They're thinking a lot of, and if you, you know, I, I used to tell people, um, you know, marriage and so on, all these different things, you know, debt. Um, I used to say, if you think people aren't thinking about out, things outside of work during the workday, boy, are you fooled, right? I, I remember watching after Game of Thrones had concluded its finale, they said that uh, um, employee productivity dropped like, it was like 65% the following day because all anybody was doing was talking about the Game of Thrones finale. And it was wild, right? But I mean, that's the kind of things, right? We've got these little devices. We want to know where our kids are at all times, family, what's going on in the world, Twitter. We're always looking at this thing to say, I want an update from the world, right? So what are we doing to really help people facilitate these things in their lives that they're scared of, that they need help with, that they're good at, to help them you know, really you know, magnify their purpose? These are the things to think about when you come under that water line. Again, how do you discover that? Analytics, right? There's, another, there's other organizations I could, I could tout and say that I've used in my life. I don't need to get into that because it's the same, same common theme as the other one. Just what are you using to go and identify those things, right? Because you want to get to the subconscious. So it's hard for me to just put a thing out there saying, here's an employee survey through SurveyMonkey, and they come back and they're like, oh, yeah, everything's great. Wow. I want to get to the subconscious. I want to know really how you're feeling, right? And sometimes it's dirty and people don't want to know. They're like, well, the, more I, the more I don't know, the better off we are, right? But be successful. Just know who the people are. And if you can't match it, that's okay. Just be honest. That's a big deal. Okay, so uh, again, analytics. Another quote, Marcus Buckingham, author of Nine Lives About Work. The talented employee may join a company because of its charismatic leaders, generous benefits, its world-class training programs, but how long that employee stays and how productive he or she is while they're there is determined by their relationship with their immediate supervisor. Again, that relationship matters tremendously on both sides of the aisle, right? People want to have people working for them that are awesome. People want to be working with great, great people. Nick Saban always has a saying. He says something to the effect of high achievers – have a despised mediocre people, and mediocre people despise high achievers. There's truth in that. It's, it's unfortunate. But people that are in comfort don't like people that are trying to go and accomplish something. It's hard because you're pushing me out of my comfort zone. There is an automatic challenge with that. So, but, again, if you want high performers, it might be hard for comfort people. But I've also worked for comfort organizations where I was trying to be a high performer, and I, it felt like a treadmill that was going too slow I was trying to sprint on. Right? You've got to find that fit. That's a big deal. Okay, in summary, there's a couple, uh, just a couple other items I want to bring up. Or we're talking about. This. Oh, number one is uh, when you look at what you can do to really be successful in your efforts with talent. I've got a couple of ideas for you. Number one, proactive networking. You should never have lunch alone. Don't have breakfast alone. Go meet people. Start to build your network today. Don't wait until people are leaving. Go meet great people all the time. Find them, find them through referrals. Find them through friends. Find them through LinkedIn. Meet people all the time. The more time you spend on human capital, it's going to set you up for success in the future, right? It's always going to lunch and finding out people and learning about them is going to be a great way, a great tool for your success. Second is attract and recite, uh, excite. When you, want to, when you want to attract people to your company, get them excited about it. Right off the front, get them excited about the opportunity. The best people to go after are not the people that are applying for your jobs, right? I used to tell people when we, we did whole job fairs at Grand America, oh, yeah, we're going to do a job fair at noon to two. I said, you know who's not coming at noon to two? Great people who have jobs right? <laughs> They're at work, right? So if you want great people, find your network. Start to, start to get to know people because there are great people that aren't really in love with what they're doing that might better align with you, right? So just go ahead and start to meet people. Be proactive about it and then attract them and excite them about opportunities. Second is assessing and evaluating. What are you doing to assess and evaluate? We just spoke to that ad nauseum. What are you using to make sure we're assessing and really trying to understand people? Once you got them excited and you've kind of learned about them, now how do we say are they going to be a good fit? Fit is everything. And I'm telling you, it's not only, it's a two-way fit. So I ask you today, if you, if you take nothing away from this, I hope that you'll learn about candor. You've got to be honest about your situation and in turn ask the person to be very honest with you so you can try to identify a good fit. There's, these are people's livelihoods and we've got a business to run. We want to lay all of our cards out on the table. And I do this at Cafe Zubas. In fact, this is scripted right from the lines that I use. It's th we're messing with your livelihood right now. I don't want to take you from an organization where you're happy and things are going well just to find out that the fit's bad and it's not going to work in 30 days because now I feel guilty for attracting you to a situation that's not going to work for you. Nobody wins in that situation. 
So the more you can try to lay your cards, I'm telling you, it takes more, it takes more time. You're going to filter through more people. But when you get that magical hire, I'm telling you, it is everything. It is everything, right? So the fact I got discovered by Cafe Zupa is because of Rob. Rob Lifford, I'm doing my consulting, and he said they were looking for a marketing person at the time. And they it just have made an offhanded comment about people. And Rob said, have you met Carl? And like, you know what? Three weeks later, I worked for the company. And I had no interest in going at all. I was like, are you kidding me? I love what I'm doing. But then they said, we love people. And I'm like, oh, I love people too. And here we are, right? So and they got me. <laughs> they sucked me in. They got that attraction and excitement. So, uh, but assess and evaluate. What are you doing? Assess and evaluate. Select and hire. Making sure the selection process is a big deal. Your onboarding process. When you offer somebody a job, that's, a, that's an oath you're making with them. Come join us. Make it exciting. Not just an email that says, well, you know, this is an offer. You know, get them excited. This is awesome. This is tremendous to us. You know, go get the band from the U of U to come. I mean, it's a big deal, right? This is a big win. So make it feel very, uh, very exciting. Onboarding, huge. Somebody's first 30, 60, 90 days, 90 days in a business is very imperative on both sides of the aisle. I always say, kill, when I'm, if I'm giving you advice for a job, I'd say your first 90 days, be impeccable. Because if you make mistakes on the back end of that, you're fine. People will remember what you started off as because that's how they're starting to grade you and judge you. If you make a mistake on that, they're going to forgive you, right? So something to think about is the onboarding. Retention. And that goes both ways for the business, too. They have a lot of problems at the very beginning, and that's going to be a challenge, and they're just going to give up. Versus everything's great, and then they have a hiccup. They'll deal with the hiccup because things are usually pretty good. Retention's huge. Look at your retention. What are you doing now that you've attracted them, retained them? Just like I, I watch all these movies like Drumline and everything. We get them all excited about coming and joining us. Then they join, and we just, like, turn our back, and we're on to the next one. Right? Make, make sure you, sh you show people. If you're guiding them in and saying, hey, we're so excited to have you, make sure while they're there, you're excited to have them. Right? Something to think about. Um, develop. What are we doing to really develop our people? And sometimes it's not in the same vertical. That kind of is a lazy way of recruitment for me. And, and all the recruiting and talent I look at is, well, you've, if you've had this title, we need to put you in that same vertical for the rest of your career. The, the market right now rejects that wholeheartedly. They want to grow even within one business. They want to say, I want to try different things out within my business to find my fit. And that's a pretty cool thing if you can, you can afford it. And you'll find, like I said, you might find somebody applied as an accounting role. But once again, operations, they actually fit better there. Right? So you really try to think about what you're doing to develop the talent. And then grow them. Grow them, grow them, grow them. What can you do to get them into bigger positions? Grow them, elevate them. And then once you've done all those things, repeat. Just keep doing it. Like I said, whatever you want to call this. These are the steps I think that will really take to success. But you've got to apply everything we've talked about with the human experience to these items and really identify what you can do to really be successful at this. This is an item you can take a picture of. I don't know if you can see the words very well. This is what I've called the, the people activity life cycle. I've created a little roadmap to say all the way from when you put out a job posting all the way to the end where really I, uh, the offboarding or the fond farewell, as I call it, you can even do terminations in a good way. You might listen, unless it's, unless it's like a sexual harassment case or something really, really bad. It's like, hey, we're not going to miss you, right? So, but the rest of it, I think, is a pretty, pretty good little piece. But you've got to think, what kind of experience are you building at every single one of these touch points? How does it feel? Because we might be good at one and not good at another. I'll tell you the one you can really zero on if you want to be a great company, uh, candidate rejections. Candidate rejections are the worst, right? People apply for a job. They sit there for an hour, typing everything in. They never hear squat. That hurts. When you're looking for a job, that hurts. One place, I, I've always given this as, as, as an idea. I don't know if anybody's ever done it. But I'd say, go find a tech company that has training. Skillsoft, one of these companies. See if you can partner with them on the back end. And say, guess what, can we get, can we order unlimited versions of, like, five classes? Three classes. Every time you reject a candidate, all you do is you attach the link to go to that class and say, listen, we're flattered. You came to work for us, unfortunately. We only had one role, and we had 150 applicants. But we love you so much and appreciate that you love our company. We're going to give you access to this training program so you can start to grow yourself and learn and hopefully gain some skills so the next time around you'll be even stronger and better for this opportunity and for any other opportunity out there. How does that feel as a candidate? feels a lot better than being ghosted. And can it cost you a lot? It can actually be relatively cheap. I mean, talk to anybody in tech. If you can gather that data, you'd be happy to partner with the company. Right? I'll give you the free course. I just want the data from it. Right? So think about those as ideas to really master some of these areas. And I'll leave a minute left, so I'm going to blow through the rest. People activity drives productivity, drives profitability, which then drives prosperity. So those are the four Ps. If you want to see results in growth, the human experience is where to make it happen. The individual approach. Also, um, 
let me see real quick. Why does peopletivity matter? I'm going to give you a couple of quick examples, and then we'll end. Number one, anybody remember doing this? I loved it. I worked at Blockbuster. 248-049-00003. That's my employee number. That's how much I love Blockbuster. <laughs> right? True story. 249-048-00003. Play it back. I promise. That's the same number. But if you look at this, we used to do this. Was it, did everybody do this? It was awesome. Right? But then what happened? They got stagnant and didn't grow and didn't try to evolve and change. This happened. And it started with Netflix, and now everybody's got a service. Right? Changed the way we did business. Because they, were we, they weren't thinking they had to change. Right? Second, second example I love, this one. Anybody remember this? My kids have found this around our house. I'm like, what? From our wedding. In fact, we had an undeveloped film. I was like, oh, that's embarrassing. But, you know, you look at this. This was a normal thing. It's kind of making a comeback now in Polaroids and stuff like that. But they went extinct. Why? Because they didn't think outside the box. Now you can just do it for free. You share it with the world immediately. You can tailor it and trim it and do everything you want to it and send it. Right? Why did that change? Well, people didn't change that own those businesses. Kodak, you can name a Polaroid, you can name Blockbuster, Hollywood Video. Because they failed to pivot. Where did they fail to pivot? They failed to pivot in innovation. Right? They don't want to innovate and create and change. Their business model. Well, now people understand. They're, we're pivoting and moving all over the place when it comes to innovation. We're trying the latest trends. But now the game has changed. Right? So innovation. You got the taxi cab company in New York, right? What happened? Whoop. Uber comes in. Says we're going to create innovation. Right? But now what's Uber's problem? Right? This. Uber lays off 14% uh, of their team May 2020. They informed all their affected employees at once via an online Zoom call. This is verbatim. With trip volume down, the difficult and unfortunate reality is there's not enough work for many frontline customer support employees. As a result, we're eliminating 3,500 frontline customer support roles. Your role is impacted. Today will be your last day working with Uber. See you later. Done. Okay? Uber's core value, be we are customer obsessed. We act like owners. Pretty well aligned, right? This is what they say they want to be. Well, they sure showed it, right? Living the brand. Second example I've got, well, there's unfair treatment. Second example is, ho is hotels, right? My industry. Well, my former industry. Well, Airbnb came along and said, we, we'll solve for the technology. We'll solve for the adapt adaption. Well, look what they did. Same exact time in the, in the year, COVID comes, they have to lay off 25% of their team. Same thing. Severance package for 1,900 employees included minimum 14 weeks of pay regardless of tenure. Could have started yesterday. Plus one week for every year at Airbnb rather than nearest year. One year of paid health insurance, accelerated stock vesting, employees get to keep their laptops, support in finding new career opportunities. I found out about this because somebody reached out to me that I knew from my hotel life, said, hey, Carl, can you help us kind of get the word out? Wow. Now, well, let's look at what their core values are. Airbnb, be a host, care for others, and make them feel like they belong. You see that alignment? What are your core values? What are you about? And how can you align people? And you can be honest. Uber's cutthroat, but they hire a lot of cutthroat people, and that's okay, right? What do you want your brand to be and how do you want it associated with people and how do you make sure you find the fit so that it aligns with your core values? So again, Airbnb's culture is great. Again, the failure to pivot didn't happen this time in innovation. It happened in peopletivity. And that's where we need to turn our attention is the peopletivity piece in our businesses in order to be safe going forward and really grow and expand our businesses. And these organizations, Starbucks, you look at Amazon, they're starting to unionize, they're starting to come together. They're saying we're tired of being treated poorly we're going to go and do all these things. All the businesses you thought would never go through that, they were high performers. Now they're going through that because they're not focused on people activity. It's fascinating. Revenues are great, but the people are leaving. It's wild. So, um, in turn, future of work is here. No, no time to delay. Comfort is the enemy of progress. If you're comfortable now, go take a very, very cold shower and get excited because we've got to pivot and we've got to change because I want every single person that's here to grow, to evolve, and to be their best self. So no time for Q&A, but I will leave my information up here. Even did a little QR code. My, my, my daughter did that for me. So do a little QR code. You can find me on LinkedIn. Please stay in touch. Let's get connected. I love new friends. Love to talk about things. I hope you learned a little bit or thought, you know, gave you some ideas about talent. Again, these are ways to get a hold of me. I'm so grateful to Rob and for the group here for inviting me to be able to share some ideas. And I hope to fraternize with you for a couple of minutes before I've got to run on. I've got to jump on a flight to go to Chicago. So really appreciate your time, and I wish you well the rest of the conference. Thank you so much.